Nina Kazan, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. So great to have you here. Thank you so much, Matthew. It's really great to be with you. And I'm very pleased to see you as well, Richard here. Thank you, Richard. You know, give us a bit of a background as to um, where you are, where you've come from, and um, and then we'll, we'll jump into this wonderful new book that you've uh, you, you've published. Okay. Well, um, I live uh, near Boston um, in the United States, and uh, um, I. Let's see, I teach at Harvard Medical School. I have a private okay. practice. I work with people who have uh, uh, various health and performance issues that they'd like to work on. Okay, wonderful. Fantastic. We, uh, now, I, I the great pleasure of being at a conference in, in Boston once, and I bought a T-shirt, <laughs> and people said to me, have you been to Harvard? And I said, yes. Anyway, it was a good lie, and uh, I didn't tell them it was only for two days. But you actually are, uh, are there in Boston doing this wonderful work. That's right. And Although I don't have a T-shirt. Yes, I know. I'll lend, I'll lend you mine. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, in it, the the book that you've recently um, written for Norton, Biofeedback and Mindfulness in Everyday Life, Practical Solutions for Improving Your Health and Performance, give us a little bit of background as to, you know, this is obviously a big part of uh, your practice, um, but tell us a little bit about the inspiration to write this book. Um, sure. So I've been uh, working with biofeedback for uh, o over 15 years at this point. I um, first got introduced to it during my uh, during my training. And, uh, you know, I didn't even really hear of it until I was told here, here's a training you can take. And I took the training and I loved it. It made such a huge difference for uh, my patients who were struggling with headaches and anxiety and high blood pressure and things like that. It was really great. Um, and then um, I was introduced to mindfulness maybe about a year after that, um, which solved most of the problems that I was having with biofeedback as in, you know, if people get stuck, you know, when they're trying to change their physiology and they're trying so hard that actually things go in the opposite direction. Um, so when mindfulness uh, uh, came into play, things suddenly got a whole lot easier, uh, you know, for me to work with people uh, professionally, personally, for me to work with myself. Um, so, and combining the two together um, has been, you know, uh, life changing and, you know, profession, profession changing for me. Uh, and over, the last, you know, decade and a half, I've been uh, combining the two, uh, teaching um, how to combine mindfulness and by feedback together, uh, using it in my practice. Um, and, um, you know, initially my students were asking me, well, tell me exactly how you do it, you know, so sort of spill it out step by step. So um, I first wrote that down and then ended up being my first book, the one that designed pr uh, primarily for practitioners who do biofeedback. Um, and then from there, it seemed to make sense to put all this information out there for people who are not um, clinicians, who are not psychologists or mental health uh, uh, professionals working with biofeedback, but for everybody to make these skills um, available because they're so powerful um, and uh, fairly easy to acquire. It sounds like it's super complicated and it's really not. Um, so my intention was to uh, make these technologically based and uh, mind-based skills um, available to um, everybody out there. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I could imagine that the, the concept of neuro, uh, neurofeedback or biofeedback could be a little bit intimidating to the average person. And um, I appreciate what you've done and to be, make it very, very um, you know, simple and practical. Yeah. And I think one of the things, a lot of the, I, my work is, is being uh, actually about reframing and rethinking about where therapies came from uh, and um, how we've, we've externalized so much of, of what we do uh, to the point where we actually don't think we can do anything. So mm -hmm. I really love the idea that you said, okay, we can use these external frameworks, these external tools, and they're very helpful, uh, but we've actually got these internal tools you know it's it's connecting it back into you and that, that that i think is is where mindfulness uh well that's when you're saying sort of get the blocks and they then get stuck and then they're trying to satisfy the equipment uh rather than than satisfy themselves and i imagine that's the sort of framework that you found that's right. That's that's exactly right. It's really empowering uh, the person to do uh, what's best for them and to feel like they can make uh, a difference for themselves without having to rely on everything external. Yeah. 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 You use this lovely analogy of the, uh, and or metaphor at the, at the beginning of your book in the introduction where you talk about an aeroplane. 
and uh, you know, like, and it's quite interesting when I was sitting there, sort of imagining myself in the being very mindful, uh, sitting in the in the pilot seat, and you know, you're saying in one bit, well, you know, how would you fly the plane without the instruments, and then sort of, well how do I naturally fly the plane with instruments? It's a really interesting metaphor. Do you want to just take us through that? And that might give people a, a, a sense of the feeling that you have of the usefulness of how we can connect all these things into a practical flying experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, imagine, you know, you are in an airplane cockpit and you're flying the uh, plane, but all the instruments are covered up. Uh, you can, uh, you know, you don't really know uh, exactly what's happening. You don't know exactly how uh, high you are. You don't know exactly in which direction you're going. You may be able to see, you know, you see some things in front of you, but you don't know exactly where you're going or what's happening um, other than, you know, what you can see directly in front of you. Uh, now, and honestly, I do not know how to fly an airplane, but I imagine that that would be a much more challenging uh, experience. It would be really hard to, you know, to uh, not crash into something, to be able to land, to, you know, arrive uh, where you need to to arrive uh, without having all those instruments. Uh, and then, you know, somebody mercifully uncovers the instrument panel and you can now see, you know, how high off the ground you are, in which direction you're going in uh, and have some guidance for landing, et cetera. Uh, and then you can get to where you need to go safely. Uh, so biofeedback provides us um, uh, with that same experience where, uh, you know, we may be able to you know, we, we see lots of things um, in front of us, uh, but there is also a lot of things that we can, we know are happening, but we don't actually know uh, how they're happening or what exactly is going on with them. You know, we might be able to feel our heart rate, but we don't know exactly what the heart is doing. We, may, we know we're breathing, but we don't know exactly what's going on with breathing. We know our muscles are doing something, but we don't know exactly what's going on with our muscles. Um, so be, having access uh, suddenly to all of that provides us with information that we did not have before we can now use uh, to... Uh, guide us in a direction in which we want to go, you know, as far as our self-care, as far as our health, as far as improving our performance go. Uh, and then, you know, co combining mindfulness, which allows us to pay attention to all of these uh, uh, instruments, uh, really uh, gives us uh, the uh, the ability to uh, figure out where we're going and how to get there uh, and the skills uh, uh, to get us uh, to that place. So yeah. on this metaphorical control panel what are some of the things that um that we are getting feedback from could you run through a list of some of the key ones um sure so um i work primarily with biofeedback not neurofeedback so Sorry. primarily work with the body um and um you know neurofeedback provides also very valuable guidance just yeah. of slightly different different kind but i will talk more about biofeedback since that's more of what i do um so the kind of guidance we get is your heart rate your heart rate variability um your breathing rate and pattern perhaps your carbon dioxide levels which determine your oxygen uh delivery uh the muscle tension your finger temperature and your skin conductance, which is activity of sweat glands on your fingertips, which is an excellent indication of overall activation of your sympathetic nervous system or the part of the nervous system that's responsible for stress activation. Okay. Yes, I, I'm always quite fascinated when I'm talking to people about these various types of knowledge and information and the neuroscience that we study. And, and they say, oh, yes, but can't you, no, would you just do it intuitively, which is kind of the mindfulness frame. But then I always remind them of that lovely uh, um, sort of thing that, that people say, if only I could do then with what I know now. Hmm, so right. these additional bits of information that we, we're able to access because as human beings, we're able to create the machinery that explores this, mm -hmm. uh, particularly there you say the heart rate variability. Everyone's now talking about vagus and the vagal tone. There mm -hmm. you go. You've got something that can give you this added insight. So this, it, you're, you're doubling down on your own capacities, but it's the mindfulness that brings us back to our own stuff. How, how was that reintegration of, uh, and how surprising was it that actually you need you, this this for you as as someone in in the sort of the, the you know the academic field to bring it back to the person? What was that like? Um, well, mind blowing, kind of. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, you uh, so you first figure out. Uh, 
that you know that you can make all these changes to the parts of your body that you didn't think you could make any changes to you know let's take the example of heart rate variability right it's a reflection of the uh, of your ability to self regulate it's a reflection of the ability of your autonomic nervous system to create the kind of activation that you need uh, and then bring that activation back uh, down for recovery uh, we didn't think we needed to do anything to it right you know your heart beats by itself you breathe you know by yourself all of that is going to function whether you pay attention to it or not but what we now know that with heart variability biofeedback, you can fine tune that ability of the body to regulate itself uh, so that we can do that self-regulation thing only much, much better, which will enable us to meet our challenges in a much better way because now our body is uh, now helping us to the maximum capacity. So it's combining with our knowledge and skills and training uh, to overcome various challenges um, in a way that uh, is now you know, perhaps much more seamless um, and um, provides us uh, with just uh, this foundational uh, kind of underlying uh, skill that we don't even need to uh, call up on uh, consciously uh, in order for it to happen. But then we bring in you know, mindfulness and we can make use of those skills uh, so much more uh, easily because what we're doing is uh, mindfulness allows us to focus our efforts to control on things that are actually under our control. You know, imagine if in a moment of challenge, uh, we bring all our attention to, oh my God, I got to relax. I got to make, you know, all those sensations of my fat, of my heart beating a little bit faster. Uh, I got to make all of that go away. I got to come down. And now you're fighting with your body. You know, your body is trying to create that optimal level of activation uh, that it's built uh, to create. Uh, and your mind is going, no, 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 no. We got to get rid of it. This is bad. Uh, you end up in a feudal fight. You don't have that kind of control. Plus, it's actually bad for you. So you end up uh, being overactivated, not being able to perform at your best at all. So when you combine the biofeedback, which brings your body to its optimal level of activation, and then the mindfulness, which allows you to recognize the sensations of that activation as helpful and adaptive, and then allows you to stay there. And here you are, you're able to use the natural helpful abilities of your mind and your body to do the best you can. This this sort of um, conditioning, in terms of time frames, is this something that we, we have to do for years to master or is it something that happens rather quickly? Can you give me some ballpark sort of yeah. understanding of that? Uh, the beauty is you don't have to do this forever. Uh, it's not a one-time thing, uh, but um, depending on the person, um, usually after about five or so weeks of training, you know, people uh, notice all sorts of uh, positive changes happening. And, you know, maybe five to eight, maybe 10 weeks of training, again, depending on the person, uh, you're getting uh, a lot of uh, benefit. Of course, the longer you continue, the more benefit you're going to reap. Uh, and if you stop, the benefit will gradually uh, go away. Uh, mm -hmm. But really, five to 10 weeks of training, uh, which is really not all that much, and we're talking about 20 minutes a day. So it's also not a huge or significant, but not a huge time commitment. Uh, and you get to uh, reap all these, uh, all these benefits. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I've, I've seen interesting discussions about the, um, that this is almost the modern rituals, uh, the, the modern ways. I mean, over the centuries, we can argue in various cultures, they've done various ways of enabling to have regulation and self-regulation. But as we go through the, the centuries, we also have to cope uh, with uh, the, the, the difficulties of modern era of sitting down a lot more and changes in diet and so, so forth. But the, the sophistication of uh, adding a lot more information information and detail uh, and knowledge base to our rituals. So moving them, you know, they're, they're, our rituals are moving more away from just straight intuition and more into a combination of integration rather than integration of knowledge. And, and this seems to me to be what we're doing. Uh, and just quickly, I'll do the question because what I'm thinking of is I'm looking at the cover, which has some, um, when I've got sort of just a, uh, I've just, just, just for you, and the cover, Rather than showing jagged movements and mad changes, it's a set of mm -hmm. lines with a wave going through it. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, uh, does that reflect on this this suggestion I'm talking about that it's really finding a naturalness utilizing modern sophistication? 
Absolutely. I really love that comparison. You know, I, you know, I didn't come up with that cover. Some really great graphic artist at, at Norton chose it, but I, I love that design and that cover. And yes, I think it reflects exactly that, that natural uh, ability of the body to um, find its rhythm. We just got to guide it to get there. Yeah, we. Well, I, I need to know now what I've then what I know now. Yeah, mm-hmm. so this gives you that that knowledge, and I've seen the, the heart rate variability um, uh, machines that that give you, and and it's quite fascinating uh, watching myself I, when I was doing it, being able to alter the alter the the, the process and alter the program. But I absolutely uh, why I love the, the the title of the book as soon as I saw it. It was what I did with that realization. It was my sense of, okay, what am I going to do? What do I want to do with the fact that I've just done this or done that? And this is what you seem to do. And you cover a lot of areas uh, in the applications, what uh, in the mm. book you call part three, because you do that. But there's a lot of different things there. Can you speak to a couple of those or do you want us to throw you a couple of ones to speak to? Uh, sure. Let me know what you'd like me to speak about. Well, let, let's go straight to the one that everybody gets into um, uh, a lot is anxiety and fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some of the frameworks there? Um, I think the most important foundation in working with anxiety and fear is letting go of the struggle with it. Um, for most of us, as soon as we experience anxiety or fear, we just want it to stop. You know, it feels terrible. It often feels overwhelming. Uh, it makes us uh, just want to, you know, get out of our skin and make the feeling go away. Uh, and ultimately, that is what perpetuates the feeling. You know, the more we fight with anxiety, the more anxious we feel, the more it spirals, you know, the more physiological changes are happening. Mm. You know, the more your breathing dysregulates, the less oxygen is going to your brain, the more confused and fuzzy you are, the less able you are to think straight, the less able you are to function, the less able you are to figure out what to do, and on and on and on. It goes into that spiral where you are really not able to figure out uh, what to do. Uh, So in order for us to make changes, we have to uh, quit struggling with anxiety. But we experience anxiety as the enemy. Uh, right. For most of us, you know, for most of the people I work with, if I ask them, you know, kind of, you know, what's the worst thing that you have to deal with? They often tell me, oh, it's the anxiety or it's the fear, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, the anxiety and the fears are considered to be the enemy. And for as long as uh, we are faced with an enemy, what are we going to do? We're going to struggle, right? Because it is really very few of us that are going to go, oh, my favorite enemy coming in here for tea. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's not going to happen for most of us. So we need to change our mind about anxiety. Uh, we, uh, it's really important to to learn to see it for what it actually is, which is a protector. Perhaps it's some uh, an overprotector, right? Um, so a metaphor I use in my book is to think about anxiety as an overprotective caregiver. You know, imagine you know yourself in a playground, you know, and you're climbing the monkey bars or the trees, or you know, doing something else that makes your mom or grandma or dad or you know your nanny uh, go, oh no 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 no, don't do that. You're going to fall and break your head, right? And they're going to uh, they might try to stop you from doing that, and maybe they pull you off the monkey bars, uh, and then you don't get to have fun, right? And uh, um, you know you don't particularly like that, right? Uh, but you know. Uh, what, you know, what is your caregiver trying to do in that moment? Are they trying to ruin your life and stop you from having fun? Well, no, right? They are trying to keep you safe. And they're not doing it in a way that's perhaps terribly helpful. And they're not doing it in a way that uh, uh, you know, feels really good. But that is what they're trying to do. They're just trying to keep you safe. Our anxiety is doing the same thing. You know, let's say you're about to you know, go on a blind date uh, and, you know, you're just terribly nervous about it. How is this going to work out? And your anxiety is telling, you know what, just cancel, don't go, you know, then you'll be safe. Right. So, and that's true, right? If you don't go, then whatever potential hazards of going on a blind date will not happen. But uh, then you also miss out on potentially meeting somebody that would be an important person in your life. Uh, And is anxiety trying to ruin your life? Well, no, even though it might feel that way in the moment, it is just trying to keep you safe. So what do you do? You acknowledge the intention of, you know, thank you. I know you're trying to protect me, but now it's up to me. What am I going to do? How am I going to respond? And you get to choose, you know, assessing the actual risk versus the potential benefit, and you get to make your own decision. You don't have to listen to the anxiety, but you also don't have to fight with it. Uh, You let it say its piece, and you make the decision, meaning that you get to choose how to respond. And a lot of what I talk about in the book is how do you choose the response? 
Yes, and it's it's not letting it go down into that spiral where, because mm -hmm. as you say, sure, it's it's finding it anxious about a blind date, but then for it to then spiral into several levels till suddenly you're cancelling and you know hiding in the cupboard, that's <laughs> exactly. no, like the, the the initial anxiety is fine. The hiding in the cupboard is kind of nuts. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And not helpful. Most importantly, just really yeah. not helpful, not in your best interest at all. And these right. skills, so you can use both mindfulness and some of the biofeedback um, mm -hmm. techniques to interrupt the spiral, the negative feedback. Uh, um, we talk about systems a lot. And once you start negative feedback loops, they'll just keep on going until you alter them into a, and shift it to a positive feedback loop. This is true. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Until you... Uh, um, realize and um, in the moment uh, become aware of what is happening uh, and then choose uh, how to respond, which may be to uh, acknowledge the anxiety and, uh, you know, let, let it be, uh, stop struggling with it. It's there. It's there for a reason. Sort of listen to what it's telling you, but also decide that the best way to respond to this is maybe take some balanced breaths, you know, some low and slow breaths that will uh, deliver maximum amount of oxygen to your brain so you can actually think straight and figure out what to do. Um, and then maybe you um, actually think about, you know, what are some reasons I'm even going on this uh, on this blind mm. date? Uh, mm. What uh, What's important about this? And am I willing to experience, you know, these initial sensations of anxiety and apprehension, which are totally normal in that situation? Am I willing to experience them in order to achieve uh, the goals that I would like to achieve and in order to live in accordance with my uh, life values, you know, whichever value might be most applicable uh, in that moment. Yeah. And, and Matt, that, that, I mean, there's your ventrolateral prefrontal yeah. cortex and your orbitolateral coming in error detecting and dorsolateral coming in making decisions and, and allowing those prefrontal cortex. But then uh, on, yeah, yeah, on a higher cortical level, once you've once you've reconstructed a new perception of the reality of what those bottle up those bottom up bodily responses are, then that new higher cortical reality then will give you a lot more sense of control and peace about what is going on. And, and so, regulation. Yeah. And regulation. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Most importantly, control over things you actually have control over as opposed yeah. to getting you stuck fighting with things you have no control over. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, here was one that was interesting too and, and that maybe has a bit of a both edges of that and that's pain. You've got a, a section, mm -hmm. a chapter on on pain. Now, that's a bit of... That's a bit of like I don't know how do you, how do you uh, uh, talk about that? I mean I've got a lot of ideas and we've talked about it before, so people know uh, it's of great interest to me. What what do you find with that one? Uh, pain is uh, pain is tough, especially chronic pain, right? Mostly we're talking about uh, chronic pain. Uh, it creates so much suffering, uh, and people are generally just not particularly willing to sit with it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about mindfulness of pain, you suggest, well, let's sit with these sensations. When the sensations are intense, uh, people are going to have a very hard time saying, yeah, okay, I'm willing to do that. Um, very often they're just not, they get stuck in, I want this to go away and why is this happening to me? Um, so this is where the biofeedback skills can come in to really take the intensity uh, of the situation uh, down to the point where the person is willing uh, to be uh, mindful and to practice their mindfulness skills. Um, mm. You know, very often, particularly with intense pain, it creates, you know, physiological changes, including um, breathing changes that reduce levels of CO2 and therefore reduce um, uh, oxygen uh, going to the brain oxygen going to the muscles. It creates uh, uh, electrolyte imbalances, which uh, uh, create muscle pain. So you're already dealing with muscle-related pain. The pain is going to intensify. So, you know, all these reactions of uh, automatic reactions to the pain uh, uh, intensify the pain. So when we uh, use biofeedback skills that have to do with uh, perhaps breathing, heart rate variability that helps regulate, uh, and uh, skills that help reduce uh, muscle activation in the moment and just brings down the intensity of the pain enough that the person can go, okay, now I'm willing to just let this be. We're taking down, you know, the bunch of top uh, top of levels that, that have inadvertently gotten created on top of the original stimulus, mm -hmm. and now the person is able and willing to sit with the original stimulus, and they're able to use their mindfulness skills. And the beauty of mindfulness when it comes to pain, it actually changes the activation uh, that's happening within the brain. So that with mindfulness, activation of the uh, part of the brain that feels the pain might uh, uh, actually increase. Uh, 
uh, some of their imaging studies show that there's some increase in the um, activation of the sensory part of pain, uh, which makes sense. If we're being mindful of pain, we're feeling a little more. But there is at the same time a decrease in the part of the brain that evaluates and judges the pain. Uh, and that's crucial because now we can experience the pain without the oh no, this is terrible, this is ruining my life, I have to make this go away. So we're able to experience uh, the pain without reacting in these unhelpful ways, but rather choose a response that is helpful, which then allows us to move on. Yeah, yeah. in all of these areas, I, I'm imagining it's, a, it's that evaluation and judgment part um, that is um, key exactly. to, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, so getting biofeedback sounds wonderful, but I'm thinking what sort of equipment would it take to do that? And how expensive is this? This sounds all very high tech and expensive. So fill us in as to what, what sort of tools are out there. Well, uh, one reason that I decided to write this book now, as opposed to, you know, even like three or four years ago, uh, is this great availability of uh, inexpensive, easily available, um, hard variability uh, training tools. I mean, some of them have been around for a while, and then there was a whole bunch of new ones um, some of them as simple as you know using a uh, camera uh, on your smartphone. Some of them are apps mm -hmm. that uh, you, you put your finger on the camera of your smartphone and it will measure your heart rate variability. They are listed in the back uh, in the back of the book, or at least okay. some of them are listed. <clears throat> Obviously, I'm not aware of all of them, uh, and some new ones have come out since uh, that uh, that part of the book has, has been written. But some of them are you know uh, totally free, uh, cost a few dollars. Um, and they're maybe not the most convenient thing in the world to keep your finger, you know, over the camera on your phone, but easily available and accessible. And then there are other devices which, uh, you know, uh, cost, uh, um, you know, one, two, three, you know, hundred dollars, you know, in American dollars, uh, yeah. that are, you know, also uh, easily used with your mobile device that are accurate and reliable and uh, uh, do a great job with both measuring and helping you train your um, heart rate ability. So in the last few years, the this problem of you know how expensive and you know, hard mm. to obtain this, this equipment is, has really uh, pretty much gone away. Yeah, and I, I, th I think it, it always uh, gets me when pe people you know, have that issue of saying, oh, that's a bit inconvenient. And I said, oh, well, we'll just keep the anxiety and the, the stress and the disturbance <laughs> and the pain, you know, as long as that's more. But it, but it is a go. difficulty. It is a difficulty. We have a world that does say um, you can get everything quickly, but but anxiety and pain and uh, and fear and anger and, you know, what are some of the other chapters? Sadness, depression, shame, guilt, mm -hmm. sleep issues. These are massive problems. And uh, I think a wee bit of, um, uh, and again, don't th that thing you say, don't fight it. It's not inconvenience. It's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, and right. you, you're quite right. I've seen some of these things. And ten years ago, you had to strap yourself up like a, you know, like like you're going into space or something. <laughs> That's right. But not anymore at all. Not anymore at That's all. Right. It's quite fabulous. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. So, Inna, is there anything that we've, uh, have we covered everything that, uh, that you've got in this wonderful book of yours? Is there something that we should be, uh, should be touching on before we leave? I mean, I really think you've got uh, most of it. Okay. Um, one thing I would add to kind of round out the discussion um, is, you know, the um, the intention of this book is really to provide people with skills that they can use in everyday life. That's the idea. Uh, you know, while this is certainly not a cure for everything, um, but the skills that I uh, encourage people to use in this book are applicable to mm -hmm. pretty much everything that happens, you know, you know, skills that are on the, on the physiological level, skills on the mindfulness level. Um, and, you know, I introduce a uh, um, acronym FLARE, which walks people step by step um, how to deal with various difficult situations. And that acronym applies pretty much to any difficult situation that you might find yourself in. So my hope, uh, you know, for people reading this book is that they would uh, find applicability uh, in lots and lots of different areas, you know, you know whether they have sort of a disorder uh, mm -hmm. or whether they're just uh, living with, you know, everyday human kind of challenges that you know all of us uh, um, encounter. Okay. So, so you get this book. It's a learning book and a doing book, and you can have a fun, loving, and really enjoyable life. Yeah. Well, look, That's if there's a flair. <laughs> <laughs> As a clinician, I'm thinking this is a great resource that, that I can have on hand um, to, you know, to step my own clients, you know, through through some of these techniques. Is that is that also um, one of your intentions that clinicians could use this as a resource? 
I certainly hope so. Um, yeah. I uh, try to make uh, the language be, you know, engaging and accessible to uh, to everybody. Uh, you know, for people, you know, who are, you know, working with a clinician or for clinicians to help their clients work through um, some of these problems. Okay, yeah, wonderful. That's what I wanted for, Matt. And, uh, you know, it's a really fantastic um, uh, companion with uh, Fabio Sinaboldi's book, who does, yes. who does a lot of things Absolutely. as well. And uh, it, it gives a, uh, I think it's, um, you know, we, there's, there's probably, you want to get four or five books in your bookshelf that really just give you that immediate access to, to great knowledge and great uh, activations. And I think this is, this in my mind, this is one of them. Okay, fantastic. But we'll leave a we'll leave a link in for everybody in the show notes. It's biofeedback and mindfulness in everyday life, practical solutions for improving your health and performance. Ina Kazan, thank you so much for being with us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Matthew and Richard. Thank you very much for having me. It's been amazing. Lovely. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.